Welcome to the seventh and final video in this series of critical appraisal modules. In this module, we will be focusing on the critical appraisal of diagnostic studies using the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme, or CASP, approach. By way of learning outcomes for this session, we aim to demonstrate to you the key principles of diagnostic studies so you will know when we might want to refer to this type of evidence and the types of bias you will want to look out for in these types of studies. We also want to get you thinking about those critical appraisal concepts relating to validity, trustworthiness of results and value and relevance in the context of diagnostic studies and how they might be applied in practice. Finally, there will be a link to a short quiz at the end of the video which will give you the opportunity to test your knowledge on concepts we will have discussed using multiple choice questions and answers. We will be making reference to a diagnostic test study entitled The Impact of a Computerised Test of Attention and Activity QB test, on Diagnostic Decision Making in Children and Young People with a Suspected Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, a single-blind randomised controlled trial by Hollis et al. Diagnostic studies are a distinct set of epidemiological study design that contribute towards the evidence base relating to the accuracy and effectiveness of diagnostic tests. Diagnostic studies assess how well a test can correctly identify or rule out a disease and the effect the diagnosis has in practice. This helps to inform subsequent decisions about treatment for clinicians, their patients and healthcare providers. Diagnostic studies may examine the diagnostic accuracy and relationship between the new test and the reference standard, also known as the gold standard test, or the effectiveness of a test in reducing the occurrence of a health problem, i.e. investigating whether a new test does more harm than good to patients. Although they can vary in their design, and diagnostic tests should ideally be compared within the same patients, or, if this is not practical, on randomised groups from the same population of patients, this ensures that differences in observed test results are because of the tests rather than differences in characteristics of patients or study methods. There are two types of commonly reported essential measures of diagnostic accuracy. These are sensitivity and specificity, often defined as the test's ability to find true positives for the disorder, sensitivity, or true negatives for the disorder, specificity. An ideal diagnostic test finds no false positives, but at the same time misses no one with a disease, that is, finds no false negatives. Sensitivity refers to the probability of a person with the condition of interest having a positive result. This is also known as the true positive proportion, or TPP. While specificity refers to the probability of a person without the condition of interest, as having a negative result, also known as the true negative proportion, or TNP. Sensitivity can be calculated in a diagnostic test accuracy study by dividing the total amount of true positives in a group by the sum of true positives plus false negatives, while specificity can be calculated by dividing the total amount of true negatives in the group by the sum of true negatives plus false positives. While sensitivity and specificity measure the accuracy of a diagnostic test, they do not provide the probability of the diagnostic value of the result of the test. Predictive values provide the proportion of patients who are correctly diagnosed. The positive predictive value is the proportion of individuals with positive test results who were correctly diagnosed, while the negative predictive value is the proportion of individuals with negative test results who were correctly diagnosed. Choosing the appropriate study design for a diagnostic study depends on the research question. The most important designs are the cross-sectional study, which help to determine the accuracy and added value of diagnostic procedures, and the randomised controlled trial, which can evaluate the clinical impact of testing. Studies that show the efficacy of a diagnostic test are also called prospective blind comparison to a gold standard study. 
This is a controlled trial that looks at patients with varying degrees of an illness and administers both diagnostic tests, the test under investigation and the gold standard test, to all patients in the study group. The sensitivity and specificity of the new test are compared to that of the reference or gold standard to determine potential usefulness. The strengths of a randomised design, as we have seen, are that they minimise problems of selection bias and confounding, and it also minimises problems of temporal ambiguity between diagnostic findings and patient outcomes. However, the limitations of this type of diagnostic study design is that randomised designs can be expensive and resource intensive, and they also require a homogeneous population. Observational designs can be less costly to undertake in diagnostic studies and often take less time to complete than randomised trials. Observational studies may also be more ethical or practical in certain situations. For example, with new technologies, randomisation may not be a viable option as it could be difficult to recruit participants to use a former standard of care. However, as we have seen in the previous topic modules on the observational research designs, Bias and confounders may weaken the evidence of diagnostic trials that are performed using an observational design. Diagnostic cohort studies are commonly performed to assess the characteristics of a diagnostic test, including sensitivity and specificity. While diagnostic cohort studies can inform us about the relative accuracy of an experimental diagnostic intervention compared to a reference standard, they do not inform us about whether the differences in accuracy are clinically important or the degree of clinical importance, in other words, the impact on patient outcomes. The accuracy of a test can be overestimated if you perform the index test initially in people that you know have the disease and then separately in healthy people. Case control studies do this rather than performing both the index and reference test in the same group of people without knowing whether or not they have the disease you are trying to diagnose. Diagnostic cross-sectional studies are the most valid study design for assessing the accuracy of diagnostic tests that compares a test's classification of a diagnosis with a reference standard in a relevant study population. This is because the design is held to reflect actual practice better and is more likely to provide a valid estimate of diagnostic accuracy. So let's take a look at the study by Hollis et al and perform a critical appraisal using the CASP checklist on diagnostic studies. The first item on the checklist asks us whether there was a clear question for the study to address. Is there enough information about the population, i.e. is it a reasonable spectrum of patients being included? Is there enough information on the test, the setting and the outcomes that are being investigated? This is something that will require your clinical judgment and you will want to make sure that no inappropriate participants were included for the diagnostic test. This question asks us to consider very similar concepts as the PICO we have seen in previous modules on interventional studies. We can see that the study by Hollis et al sought to evaluate the impact of providing a computerised test of attention and activity, known as the QB test, report, on the speed and accuracy of diagnostic decision making. The authors contextualise and justify their research question by highlighting the need for diagnostic decision aids with an objective measure, that is the QB test, to complement the prevailing subjective diagnostic methods used for ADHD, which on their own can lead to diagnostic uncertainty and delay. The authors describe the QB test as a computerised continuous performance test combined with an objective measure of motor activity using an infrared camera that takes around 20 minutes to complete. The QB test is a diagnostic decision aid to be used alongside standard comprehensive assessment. Participants to be included were aged 6 to 17 years old and were referred to their first ADHD assessment. The trial was conducted across 10 child and adolescent mental health services and community paediatric clinic sites in England, which were selected to reflect the mix of ADHD services nationally. The primary outcome of interest was the number of appointments until a diagnosis of ADHD was confirmed or excluded within six months of baseline. 
all secondary outcomes have also been detailed appropriately. The next item asks us whether the reference test was the best available indicator in the circumstances. Is the new test being compared with the current best possible diagnostic approach? The procedure for administering the test has been detailed fully and all participants received assessment as usual for ADHD, followed by the QB test. Again, the authors have already highlighted that current subjective diagnostic methods for ADHD can lead to uncertainty and delay in accurate diagnosis. The authors in this study compared the QB test as a diagnostic decision aid to be used alongside standard comprehensive assessment, not to be used as a standalone diagnostic test. The authors detail that the reference standard assessments varied between study sites in this pragmatic trial in order to reflect real life practice. Classification bias can occur in diagnostic studies where there are errors in the reference test and can undermine sensitivity and specificity. Misclassification can vary from study site to site depending on the methodology associated with the reference test. Stratified randomization was used in this study in order to balance potential effects of non-standardised assessments between study sites, with authors detailing assessment practices between treatment centres in the appendix to this publication. This question asks us to consider whether both the reference standard and the test were received regardless of results of the test of interest. There is a risk of verification bias when there is a selective use of a single reference standard diagnostic test in a study in which some patients are given the reference standard while others are not. This type of bias can be avoided by including a spectrum of patients who are at risk for a particular disease or condition, not just those patients identified with the reference standard. In the Hollis et al study, all participants received assessment as usual for ADHD followed by the QB test. All participants received the QB test at one of their first three clinical appointments. Participants were then randomly assigned to their clinician either immediately receiving the QB test report or having the report withheld until the study end. All clinicians at a site assessed patients both with and without the QB test report. Therefore, all participants received both tests regardless of the result of the QB test. A threat to validity arises when a patient's reference standard is applied or interpreted by someone who already knows that patient's diagnostic test result and vice versa. Was there blinding? Were tests performed independently? And is review bias present? Review bias can occur when the interpretation of the reference test is not independent of the index test, which weakens the result of retrospective studies. The impact on diagnostic accuracy of adding the QB test report to routine assessment was evaluated by comparing the clinician's diagnosis with and without access to QB test report against an independent consensus research diagnosis made blind to group allocation. The authors used independent blinded research diagnostic assessments to compare diagnostic accuracy between the two trial arms. With the prospective design used in this study and the fact that there was adequate blinding, this lessens the risk of review bias. For this item, we want to be sure that relevant participants have been selected, i.e. with similar disease stage and severity and be able to determine whether a reasonable spectrum of patients have been included. It is widely recognised that diagnostic accuracy is very much dependent on the spectrum of included patients and the results of relevant tests. And these may differ, for example, for primary care patients and patients referred to a hospital. Differences in disease severity is known as spectrum bias with disease severity being influenced by many factors, including the setting, referral patterns and prior testing. We would expect diagnostic accuracy to be greater in a study conducted in a population with advanced disease than a population with less severe disease. In the study by Hollis et al, 
A previous ADHD diagnosis served as an exclusion criteria, as well as people non-fluent in English and with suspected moderate to severe learning disability. Participants were referred for their first ADHD assessment. It is not clear the criteria used by the referring clinicians, and the authors do contextualise the difficulty in making ADHD diagnosis with dominant subjective criteria. However, they do seem to have made efforts to homogenise their participants as far as possible in a pragmatic trial, which aim to increase ecological validity and generalizability to routine care in similar clinical settings. Have the authors been transparent in their approach and provided a protocol to their study? We can see that Hollis et al. published a protocol with amendments made after it became clear that around 30% of their sample had not received a diagnostic decision within a six-month study period. Their revisions factored into account a revised statistical power calculation and an increased participant sample size in order to provide more reliability in the results. The authors have detailed their methods and published their revisions, as well as clearly describing the methods for performing the QB test. However, the authors do detail a secondary analysis that was not specified in the published protocol and was conducted on the primary outcome stratified by type of QB test administered. This could be a concern for bias. However, the authors do detail the reasons for this in their supplementary analysis in Appendix 4. The authors present results that clinicians with access to the QB test report were more likely to reach a diagnostic decision about ADHD. At six months, 76% of those with a QB test report had received a diagnostic decision, compared with 50% without the report. QB test reduced appointment length by 15% and increased clinicians' confidence in their diagnostic decisions and doubled the likelihood of excluding ADHD. The diagnostic accuracy between groups was compared using receiver operating characteristic curve modelling, which is a common measure for diagnostic accuracy. ROC is useful for evaluating the performance of diagnostic tests that classify individuals into categories of those with and those without a condition. The authors clearly present all of their statistical measures in accompanying appendices, which we can closely inspect. The authors found that there was no difference in diagnostic accuracy. This checklist item takes us back to the principle of precision in results. Let's take a look at some of the measures used and the confidence intervals of some of the key findings. For the primary outcome of number of appointments until a diagnosis, clinicians with access to the QB test report were more likely to reach a diagnostic decision about ADHD with a hazard ratio of 1.44 and a 95% confidence interval of 1.04 to 2.01, which does seem to provide a fairly narrow confidence interval. For the secondary outcome of clinician confidence in diagnostic decision, the Likert scale used to measure this outcome was developed for this particular study and had not gone through any peer review process to ascertain the scale's validity or reliability. Although the confidence interval for this result was fairly narrow, with an odds ratio of 1.77 and a 95% confidence interval of 1.09 to 2.89, the use of the unvalidated measure could be a cause for uncertainty in this result, and it is also possible that clinician confidence levels were influenced by prior experience of using the commercially available test, the frequency of which seemed to vary between study sites. Are your patients or population so different from those in the study that the results cannot be applied, such as age, sex, ethnicity and spectrum bias? This takes us back to the initial question of the spectrum of participants being included in the study. We know, based on the study's inclusion criteria, that participants to be included were aged 6 to 17 years old, and were referred for their first ADHD assessment with the trial conducted across 10 child and adolescent mental health services and community paediatric clinic sites in England. If used in the UK context, this trial does present greater ecological validity and generalizability 
due to its pragmatic nature within the spectrum of included participant characteristics. We can see from the study's socio-demographic characteristics that more males are represented within the included participants, accounting for around 79%. However, this may reflect current understanding that ADHD is more common in males than females. What are the costs and availability associated with the new test? And how feasible is it that it could be implemented into current practice? The QB test is a commercially available measure of ADHD symptoms approved by the American Food and Drugs Administration that requires additional equipment including an infrared camera designed to track the movement of a marker attached to a headband worn during the test in order to measure activity. This study's health economic analysis suggests that QB testing provided small cost savings for the health service and generally improved outcomes with the QB test priced in the UK between £20 and £22 per patient. However, the economic analysis did not factor in the cost of purchasing and administering the QB test. Therefore, any cost-saving claims should be interpreted with caution. Will knowledge of the test result improve patient well-being or lead to a change in patient management? This diagnostic study was performed in order to evaluate the impact on speed and accuracy of diagnostic decision-making in children with suspected ADHD. The authors justify this objective by considering the impact that subjective diagnostic measures can have on both speed and accuracy in diagnosis, which could well have impact on patients and families or their caregivers awaiting an ADHD diagnosis. The authors additionally qualitatively investigated the user experience of clinicians, families and young people of performing and using the QB test, the results of which, however, are published in another journal but are referenced in their background section to this study. To get an all-round picture of the study findings, we would want to interpret all results, qualitative and quantitative, from this RCT collectively from the various publication sources in order to determine how far knowledge of the test and its results could improve patient well-being as well as change patient management. The final question is again really up to you. Using your clinical judgment and awareness of your patients and practice culture, what would you think based on a critical reading of the evidence and the conclusions drawn? Thank you for listening. These training videos have been developed by the Cochrane Common Mental Disorders Group at the University of York, with the support from Tees Esk and Weir Valley's NHS Foundation Trust, Northumberland Tyne and Weir NHS Foundation Trust, and the Economic and Social Research Council. If you would like to test your knowledge on the topics introduced in this module, please follow the link below this video, which will take you to a short online quiz.